This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Little Lame Prince by Miss Mullock. Chapter 6. The fourth day it happened that the deaf mute paid his accustomed visit, after which Prince Dolores' spirits rose. They always did when he got the new books, which, just to relieve his conscience, the king of no man's land regularly sent to his nephew, with many new toys also, though the latter were disregarded now. "'Toys, indeed, when I'm a big boy!' said the prince with disdain, and would scarcely condescend to mount a rocking-horse, which had come, somehow or other, I can't be expected to explain things very exactly, packed on the back of the other, the great black horse which stood and fed contentedly at the bottom of the tower. Prince Dolor leaned over and looked at it, and thought how grand it must be to get upon its back, this grand live steed, and ride away, like the pictures of knights. "'Suppose I was a knight,' he said to himself, "'then I should be obliged to ride out and see the world.' But he kept all these thoughts to himself, and just sat still, devouring his new books till he had come to the end of them all. It was a repast not unlike the Barmecide's feast, which you read of in the Arabian Nights, which consisted of very elegant but empty dishes, or that supper of Sancho Panza in Don Quixote, where the minute the smoking dishes came on the table, the physician waved his hand and they were all taken away. Thus almost all the ordinary delights of boy life had been taken away from, or rather never given to, this poor little prince. I wonder, he would sometimes think, I wonder what it feels like to be on the back of a horse galloping away, or holding the reins in a carriage and tearing across the country, or jumping a ditch, or running a race, such as I read of or see in pictures. What a lot of things there are that I should like to do. But first, I should like to go and see the world. I'll try. Apparently it was his godmother's plan always to let him try, and try hard, before he gained anything. This day the knots that tied up his traveling cloak were more than usually troublesome, and he was a full half-hour before he got out into the open air, and found himself floating merrily over the top of the tower. Hitherto, in all his journeys, he had never let himself go out of sight of home, for the dreary building, after all, was home. He remembered no other. But now he felt sick of the very look of his tower, with its round, smooth walls and level battlements. "'Off we go!' cried he, when the cloak stirred itself with a slow motion, as if awaiting his orders. "'Anywhere, anywhere, so that I am off from here and out into the world!' As he spoke, the cloak, as if suddenly seized with a new idea, bounded forward and went skimming through the air, faster than the very fastest railway train. "'Gee up! Gee up!' cried Prince Dolor in great excitement. "'This is as good as riding a race!' And he patted the cloak as if it had been a horse, that is, in the way he supposed horses ought to be patted, and tossed his head back to meet the fresh breeze and pulled his coat collar up and his hat down, as he felt the wind grow keener and colder, colder than anything he had ever known. "'What does it matter, though?' said he. "'I'm a boy, and boys ought not to mind anything.' Still, for all his good will, by and by, he began to shiver exceedingly. Also, he had come away without his dinner, and he grew frightfully hungry. And to add to everything, the sunshiny day changed into rain, and being high up, in the very midst of the clouds, he got soaked through and through in a very few minutes. "'Shall I turn back?' meditated he. "'Suppose I say abracadabra.' Here he stopped, for already the cloak gave an obedient lurch, as if it were expecting to be sent home immediately. "'No, I, I can't. I can't go back. I must go forward and see the world.' "'But, oh, if I had but the shabbiest old rug to shelter me from the rain, "'or the driest morsel of bread and cheese, just to keep me from starving! "'Still, I don't much mind. "'I'm a prince, and ought to be able to stand anything. "'Hold on, Cloak. We'll make the best of it.' 
It was a most curious circumstance, but no sooner had he said this than he felt stealing over his knees something warm and soft, in fact, a most beautiful bearskin, which folded itself round him quite naturally, and cuddled him up as closely as if he had been the cub of the kind old mother bear that once owned it. Then feeling in his pocket, which suddenly stuck out in a marvelous way, he found, not exactly bread and cheese, nor even sandwiches, but a packet of the most delicious food he had ever tasted. It was not meat, nor pudding, but a combination of both, and it served him excellently for both. He ate his dinner with the greatest gusto imaginable, till he grew so thirsty he did not know what to do. "'Couldn't I have just one drop of water, if it didn't trouble you too much, kindest of godmothers?' for he really thought this want was beyond her power to supply. All the water which supplied Hopeless Tower was pumped up with difficulty from a deep artesian well. There were such things known in No Man's Land, which had been made at the foot of it. But around, for miles upon miles, the desolate plain was perfectly dry. And above it, high in the air, how could he expect to find a well, or to get even a drop of the water? He forgot one thing the rain. While he spoke, it came on in another wild burst, as if the clouds had poured themselves out in a passion of crying, wetting him certainly, but leaving behind, in a large glass vessel which he had never noticed before, enough water to quench the thirst of two or three boys at least. And it was so fresh, so pure, as water from the clouds always is when it does not catch the soot from city chimneys and other defilements, that he drank it, every drop, with the greatest delight and content. Also, as soon as it was empty, the rain filled it again, so that he was able to wash his face and hands, and refresh himself exceedingly. Then the sun came out and dried him in no time. After that he curled himself up under the bearskin rug, and though he determined to be the most wide-awake boy imaginable, being so exceedingly snug and warm and comfortable, Prince Dolor condescended to shut his eyes just for one minute. The next minute he was sound asleep. When he awoke he found himself floating over a country quite unlike anything he had ever seen before. Yet it was nothing but what most of you children see every day and never notice. A pretty country landscape, like England, Scotland, France, or any other land you choose to name. It had no particular features, nothing in it grand or lovely, was simply pretty, nothing more. Yet to Prince Dolor, who had never gone beyond his lonely tower and level plain, it appeared the most charming sight imaginable. First there was a river. It came tumbling down the hillside, frothing and foaming, playing at hide-and-seek among the rocks, then bursting out in noisy fun like a child, to bury itself in deep, still pools. Afterward it went steadily on for a while, like a good grown-up person, till it came to another big rock, where it misbehaved itself extremely. It turned into a cataract, and went tumbling over and over, after a fashion that made the prince, who had never seen water before, except in his bath or his drinking cup, clap his hands with delight. It is so active, so alive! I like things active and alive, cried he, and watched it shimmering and dancing, whirling and leaping, till, after a few windings and vagaries, it settled into a respectable stream. After that it went along, deep and quiet, but flowing steadily on, till it reached a large lake, into which it slipped, and so ended its course. All this the boy saw, either with his own naked eye or through his gold spectacles. He saw also, as in a picture, beautiful but silent, many other things which struck him with wonder, especially a grove of trees. Only think, to have lived to his age, which he himself did not know, as he did not know his own birthday, and never to have seen trees. As he floated over these oaks they seemed to him, trunk, branches, and leaves, the most curious sight imaginable. "'If I could only get nearer so as to touch them,' said he, and immediately the obedient cloak ducked down. Prince Dolor made a snatch at the topmost twig of the tallest tree, and caught a bunch of leaves in his hand. Just a bunch of green leaves, such as we see in myriads, watching them bud, grow, 
fall, and then kicking them along on the ground as if they were worth nothing. Yet how wonderful they were, every one of them a little different. I don't suppose you could ever find two leaves exactly alike in form, color, and size. No more than you could find two faces alike, or two characters exactly the same. The plan of this world is infinite similarity, and yet infinite variety. Prince Dolor examined his leaves with the greatest curiosity, and also a little caterpillar that he found walking over one of them. He coaxed it to take an additional walk over his finger, which it did with the greatest dignity and decorum, as if it, Mr. Caterpillar, were the most important individual in existence. It amused him for a long time, and when a sudden gust of wind blew it overboard, leaves and all, he felt quite disconsolate. Still, there must be many live creatures in the world besides caterpillars. I should like to see a few of them. The cloak gave a little dip down, as if to say, All right, my prince, and bore him across the oak forest to a long, fertile valley, called in Scotland a strath, and in England a weald, but what they call in the tongue of no man's land I do not know. It was made up of cornfields, pasture fields, lanes, hedges, brooks, and ponds. Also in it were what the prince desired to see, a quantity of living animals, wild and tame. Cows and horses, lambs and sheep, fed in the meadows. Pigs and fowls walked about the farmyards, and in lonelier places hares scudded, rabbits burrowed, and pheasants and partridges, with many other smaller birds, inhabited the fields and woods. Through his wonderful spectacles the prince could see everything. But, as I said, it was a silent picture. He was too high up to catch anything except a faint murmur, which only aroused his anxiety to hear more. "'I have as good as two pairs of eyes,' he thought. "'I wonder if my godmother would give me a second pair of ears.' Scarcely had he spoken than he found lying on his lap the most curious little parcel, all done up in silvery paper. And it contained, what do you think? Actually a pair of silver ears, which, when he tried them on, fitted so exactly over his own that he hardly felt them, except for the difference they made in his hearing. There is something which we listen to daily and never notice. I mean the sounds of the visible world, animate and inanimate. Winds blowing, waters flowing, trees stirring, insects whirring. Dear me! I am quite unconsciously writing rhyme. With the various cries of birds and beasts, lowing cattle, bleeding sheep, grunting pigs and cackling hens, all the infinite discords that somehow or other make a beautiful harmony. We hear this, and are so accustomed to it that we think nothing of it. But Prince Dolor, who had lived all his days in the dead silence of Hopeless Tower, heard it for the first time, and, oh! If you had seen his face! He listened, listened as if he could never have done listening, and he looked and looked as if he could not gaze enough. Above all, the motion of the animals delighted him. Cows walking, horses galloping, little lambs and calves running races across the meadows were such a treat for him to watch, he that was always so quiet. But these creatures, having four legs, and he only two, the difference did not strike him painfully. Still, by and by, after the fashion of children, and, I fear, of many big people, too, he began to want something more than he had, something fresh and new. Godmother, he said, having now begun to believe that, whether he saw her or not, he could always speak to her with full confidence that she would hear him. Godmother, all these creatures I like exceedingly. "'But I should like better to see a creature like myself. "'Couldn't you show me just one little boy?' "'There was a sigh behind him. "'It might have been only the wind, "'and the cloak remained so long balanced motionless in air "'that he was half afraid his godmother had forgotten him "'or was offended with him for asking too much. "'Suddenly a shrill whistle startled him, "'even through his silver ears, "'and looking downward he saw start up from behind a bush on a common.' something neither a sheep nor a horse nor a cow nothing upon four legs this creature had only two but they were long straight and strong and it had a lithe active body and a curly head of black hair set upon its shoulders 
It was a boy, a shepherd boy, about the prince's own age. But, oh, so different! Not that he was an ugly boy, though his face was almost as red as his hands, and his shaggy hair matted like the backs of his own sheep. He was rather a nice-looking lad, and seemed so bright and healthy and good-tempered. Jolly would be the word, only I am not sure if they had such a one in the elegant language of no-man's land. "'that the little prince watched him with great admiration. "'Might he come and play with me? "'I would drop down to the ground to him, "'or fetch him up to me here. "'Oh, how nice it would be "'if only I had a little boy to play with me!' "'But the cloak, usually so obedient to his wishes, "'disobeyed him now. "'There were evidently some things "'which his godmother either could not or would not give. "'The cloak hung stationary, high in the air, never attempting to descend. The shepherd lad evidently took it for a large bird, and, shading his eyes, looked up at it, making the prince's heart beat fast. However, nothing ensued. The boy turned round with a long, loud whistle, seemingly his usual and only way of expressing his feelings. He could not make the thing out exactly. It was rather a mysterious affair, but it did not trouble him much. He was not an examining boy. Then, stretching himself, for he had been evidently half asleep, he began flopping his shoulders with his arms to wake and warm himself, while his dog, a rough collie, who had been guarding the sheep meanwhile, began to jump upon him, barking with delight. "'Down, snap, down! Stop that, or I'll thrash you!' the prince heard him say, though with such a rough, hard voice and queer pronunciation that it was hard to make the words out. "'Hallo!' "'Let's warm ourselves by a race!' "'They started off together, boy and dog, barking and shouting, "'till it was doubtful which made the more noise or ran the faster. "'A regular steeplechase it was, first across the level common, "'greatly disturbing the quiet sheep, "'and then tearing across the country, "'scrambling through hedges and leaping ditches, "'and tumbling up and down over ploughed fields. "'They did not seem to have anything to run for, "'but as if they did it, both of them, for the mere pleasure of motion. And what a pleasure that seemed! To the dog, of course, but scarcely less so to the boy. How he skimmed along over the ground, his cheeks glowing and his hair flying and his legs. Oh, what a pair of legs he had! Prince Dolor watched him with great intentness, and in a state of excitement almost equal to that of the runner himself, for a while. Then his sweet, pale face grew a trifle paler. The lips began to quiver and the eyes to fill. "'How nice it must be to run like that,' he said softly, thinking that never, no, never in this world, would he be able to do the same. Now he understood what his godmother had meant when she gave him his traveling cloak, and why he had heard that sigh. He was sure it was hers.' when he had asked to see just one little boy. "'I think I had rather not look at him again,' said the poor little prince, drawing himself back into the center of his cloak, and resuming his favorite posture, sitting like a Turk, with his arms wrapped around his feeble, useless legs. "'You're no good to me,' he said, patting them mournfully. "'You never will be any good to me. I wonder why I had you at all. I wonder why I was born at all.' since I was not to grow up like other boys. Why not? A question so strange, so sad, yet so often occurring in some form or other in this world, as you will find, my children, when you are older, that even if he had put it to his mother, she could only have answered it, as we have to answer many difficult things, by simply saying, I don't know. There is much that we do not know and cannot understand. We big folks know more than you little ones. We have to accept it all, just as you have to accept anything which your parents may tell you, even though you don't as yet see the reason of it. You may sometime, if you do exactly as they tell you, and are content to wait. Prince Dolor sat a good while thus, or it appeared to him a good while. So many thoughts came and went through his poor young mind, thoughts of great bitterness, which, little though he was, seemed to make him grow years older in a few minutes. Then he fancied the cloak began to rock gently to and fro, with a soothing kind of motion, as if he were in somebody's arms. 
somebody who did not speak, but loved him and comforted him without need of words, not by deceiving him with false encouragement or hope, but by making him see the plain, hard truth in all its hardness, and thus letting him quietly face it, till it grew softened down and did not seem nearly so dreadful after all. Through the dreary silence and blankness, for he had placed himself so that he could see nothing but the sky, and had taken off his silver ears as well as his gold spectacles. What use was there of either when he had no legs with which to walk or run? Up from below there rose a delicious sound. You have heard it hundreds of times, my children, and so have I. When I was a child I thought there was nothing so sweet, and I think so still. It was just the song of a skylark, mounting higher and higher from the ground till it came so close that Prince Dolor could distinguish his quivering wings and tiny body, almost too tiny to contain such a gush of music. "'Oh, you beautiful, beautiful bird!' cried he. "'I should dearly like to take you in and cuddle you. That is, if I could, if I dared.' But he hesitated. The little brown creature with its loud heavenly voice almost made him feel afraid. Nevertheless, it also made him feel happy, and he watched and listened, so absorbed that he forgot all regret and pain, forgot everything in the world except the little lark. It soared and soared, and he was just wondering if it would soar out of sight, and what in the world he should do when it was gone, when it suddenly closed its wings, as larks do when they mean to drop to the ground. But, instead of dropping to the ground, it dropped right into the little boy's breast. What felicity! If only it would stay! A tiny, soft thing to fondle and kiss, to sing to him all day long, and be his playfellow and companion, tame and tender, while to the rest of the world it was a wild bird of the air. What a pride! What a delight! To have something that nobody else had, something all his own! As the traveling cloak traveled on, he little heeded where, and the lark still stayed, nestled down in his bosom, hopped from his hand to his shoulder, and kissed him with its dainty beak, as if it loved him. Prince Dolor forgot all his grief, and was entirely happy. But when he got in sight of Hopeless Tower, a painful thought struck him. "'My pretty bird, what am I to do with you? If I take you into my room, and shut you up there, you, a wild skylark of the air, what will become of you? I am used to this.' but you are not. You will be so miserable. And suppose my nurse should find you, she who can't bear the sound of singing. Besides, I remember her once telling me that the nicest thing she ever ate in her life was lark pie. The little boy shivered all over at the thought, and though the merry lark immediately broke into the loudest carol, as if saying derisively that he defied anybody to eat him, still Prince Dolor was very uneasy. In another minute he had made up his mind. No, my bird, nothing so dreadful should happen to you if I can help it. I would rather do without you altogether. Yes, I'll try. Fly away, my darling, my beautiful. Good-bye, my merry, merry bird. Opening his two caressing hands in which, as if for protection, he had folded it, he let the lark go. It lingered a minute, perching on the rim of the cloak, and looking at him with eyes of almost human tenderness. Then away it flew, far up into the blue sky. It was only a bird. But some time after, when Prince Dolor had eaten his supper, somewhat drearily, except for the thought that he could not possibly sup off lark pie now, and gone quietly to bed, the old familiar little bed, where he was accustomed to sleep, or lie awake contentedly thinking, Suddenly he heard outside the window a little faint carol, faint but cheerful, cheerful even though it was the middle of the night. The dear little lark! It had not flown away after all. It was truly the most extraordinary bird, for, unlike ordinary larks, it kept hovering about the tower in the silence and darkness of the night, outside the window or over the roof. Whenever he listened for a moment, he heard it singing still. He went to sleep as happy as a king. End of chapter 6